Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Family Stories, the podcast written by you, our listeners. This is the last in the current series of Family Stories, but we've saved some crackers for this episode. And fear not, our producers are already turning their attention to the next series, which will return in the summer. Today's Family Stories include the desert experiences of an 8th Army medic, the Sicilian adventures of a dispatch rider, and how wooden sheep helped fool the Luftwaffe. We begin this week with this from Liz Coward. Dear James and Al, I love We Have Ways and the wonderfully warm family it's spawned. It really is a great community. I've recently discovered the Family Stories podcasts and wanted to share that of my great friend, 106-year-old William Earl. I met Bill on Remembrance Sunday in 2009 at my in-laws, I was fascinated to hear his story about serving in an RAMC field ambulance and resolved to interview him for my blog. The next time we met, he greeted me with, I'm a D-Day Dodger and I still hate Mark Clark for what he did to Anzio. He had me at I'm a D-Day Dodger. I ditched the blog and instead spent the next seven years writing his memoir, Blood and Bandages. Bill is like family to me, so thank you for letting me share his story of love, courage and humanity. In May 1940, William Earle was a handsome and happy 25-year-old pharmacy assistant in London, gloriously in love with his beautiful soulmate, Mary Standen. In late May, just after Dunkirk, my call-up papers finally arrived. Mum had been fearing the day. She just sobbed and sobbed when she saw them. Dad was terribly bothered, but he kept calm. I read it and thought, I've struck it lucky. I'd been ordered to join a field ambulance in the Royal Army Medical Corps, so I thought I'd just be a male nurse and pick people up and carry them about on a stretcher. Had I known what a field ambulance actually did, I'd have been terribly upset. It was just like being in the infantry, but without a rifle. William was going into action, armed only, with a Red Cross brassard. I was told to report to Euston Station at 12 noon on the 2nd of July. Mary was determined to see me off, and after a tearful farewell with my mother, we left for Euston. When we arrived, we saw loads of army trucks lined up outside and about a hundred chaps milling about. It got very emotional when the time came for us to say goodbye, but we knew we would see each other again. After Mary left, I reported to a sergeant and I was told I was joining the 214th Field Ambulance, assigned to the 56th London Division, the Black Cats. I was told to sit and wait in one of the trucks. As it slowly filled up, we discovered that most of us were either pharmacists or pharmacy assistants like me. When the last man clambered in, the tailgate was slammed shut and off we went. We had no idea to where. Instead of heading for basic training, William and the other 95 new recruits were on their way to Kent for immediate active service with the 214th, protecting the south of England from the threat of the imminent German invasion. We trained during the day and at night camped in a little tent in the middle of a field watching for German paratroopers. I was armed with a pickaxe handle and a whistle, which was to give a warning blast to the man in the next field. I never really knew what they expected me to do with the pickaxe handle. The training was intense. We were posted to local hospitals, Canterbury in my case, where we assisted the nurses with their ward duties and watched operations. We were taught about hygiene and sanitation and how to handle gas attacks, we practised camouflage map reading and went on 20-mile route marches. They treated us like we were in the infantry, but we were civilian medical men first and soldiers second. We were all equal in our eyes, so why should we salute officers when they walked by? We were pulled up for that. All the time, it was drilled into us that we were not there to fight the enemy. Our job was to save all wounded in accordance with the Geneva Convention, regardless of whether friend or foe. We were classified as non-combatants and issued with a registered red cross brassard, which was, of course, invisible at night. After seven months, we sat our exams and only those with sufficiently high scores and a demonstrable inclination to care for the sick were designated the trade of nursing orderly class three. Those that failed joined other units like the Royal Engineers or Royal Army Service Corps. By autumn 1941, 
It was clear we were destined for overseas. I told Mary that I'd love to be married to her, even if it was for a short time. I got five days' leave, and, on the eve of our wedding, I gave her a letter. It said, I am gloriously happy. No one could be more happy than me, as very soon, darling, you, the most glorious and most wonderful girl alive, will become my darling wife. They were married on the 29th November 1941, and, six months later, their son David was born. By this time, William had been promoted to nursing orderly class 2, and the 214th had replaced men unsuitable for action. Frank Allen, a boot and shoemaker from Northampton, was among the replacements. We clicked instantly over our shared love of football, so the sergeant put him in A1 section to work with me. In August 1942, the 214th entrained to Liverpool, where the 56th was gathering to join a convoy assembling west of Glasgow. 5,000 of us were crammed on the Franconia too. I found a place under a mess table and Frank got the one next to me. We were already good friends, but really got to know each other on board. By the time we arrived in Freetown, we had become inseparable, and I would have happily embraced Frank as my brother. They eventually joined the 8th Army, and on the 22nd of April 1943, the 214th arrived at Hergler, Tunisia, 20 miles from the front line. The Queens were ordered to advance the next day. Reinforcements were an obvious target, so as we got closer, the Queens started to spread out, and we slowed down. We travelled at the rear of the convoy, because if we got too close to the infantry, we could get caught up in enemy fire. We saw that three to four of our ambulances had gone ahead and got mixed up with the troops. We looked on helplessly as they got caught in the middle of a shelling. We later learnt that the division's first dead was one of ours. Our casualty collecting post was the closest to the fighting, and once the shelling stopped we started to evacuate the wounded. We knew that if it restarted we couldn't take cover. We'd have to keep going and hope for the best. We never knew what type of injuries we would encounter. Sometimes we would find a soldier screaming in agony because half his leg had been blown off. Other times we'd attempt to carry a man, but when we grabbed his arms, one of them would come off in our hands. Some men were so badly injured that all we could do was make them comfortable and leave them to die. It was grim, but this was what we'd been trained to do, and if we couldn't do it, we shouldn't be there. There was only one thing that turned me over trying to remove the tank crews from brewed-up tanks. The sight of those poor souls was nasty. Really nasty. On the 12th of May, the Axis forces finally surrendered. The wounded were still coming in, so A Company was ordered to take over a German advanced dressing station. Medical men had no enemies, and the Germans had respected the Geneva Convention, so we were happy to join them. For the next week, we worked side by side and got on very well together, being there made me realise that the normal German soldier was no different from me. They had wives and sweethearts and children too, but just like us, had to do what the government told them, whether they wanted to or not. When the last casualty left, the ADS closed, and Frank and I returned to our field ambulance. It was camped outside Tripoli. We all used to run naked into the sea and forget about the fighting and just relax. Enfideville was a baptism of fire, so we thought, we're battle-hardened troops now, we can cope with anything. Little did we know, because then, of course, came Italy. That was just part of the story of Bill Earl, sent in by Liz Coward. Our next story is from Andrew Tooley. Dear James and Al, my dad was a dispatch rider in the Royal Signals. He was in the front line across North Africa as part of Operation Torch and then landed in Sicily. I'm in the process of reading James's book on the Sicily campaign, but can't seem to find my dad's name, which I'm sure is an oversight. Yes, sorry about that. My dad landed at Salerno. He spoke most about when he was part of General Clark's Fifth Army, and what he thought of him is best left for another day. Like many of those from that generation who found themselves in a similar position, he never thought of himself as being anything special, but to me he was special. He was a hero. He was my dad and I was proud of him. Being a dispatch rider, he used to run messages between UK and Commonwealth troops and the Americans, and he always said how generous the average American soldier and junior officers were. He would especially mention how much better their rations were than those he was issued with. When he delivered a message to the Americans, they'd take him to their mess for something to eat and a coffee before his return journey. On one occasion, a senior US officer complained that my dad's uniform was dirty. 
That was despite the fact he'd ridden through the dirt, the rain and general battlefield conditions. So was it any surprise there was some dirt on his kit? As we're all aware, the front line is always shifting sands. But in this case, it was more like shifting mud. The terrain made a straightforward A to B route difficult, and on some occasions, impossible. After leaving the American encampment, Dad made for the British lines, but had to make detour after detour. After a while, he pulled over to check his map and heard some voices approaching from around the bend. He was about to ask for directions when he realised they were speaking German. He wheeled his motorbike back a few feet to where there was an indentation in a hedge. He managed to get his bike in there while he climbed through the hedge and hid in a water drainage ditch. He heard the Germans come towards him. They stopped and he could see through a gap the patrol were pushing their bayonets into the hedge. They did this for a few metres when he heard what sounded like artillery in the distance and the patrol rapidly turned around and retreated. He lay there for a couple of hours, fearing the patrol would return. When they didn't, he climbed out of the ditch, wheeled his bike away to a safe distance before he kick-started it and made his way back to the British lines by zigzagging around the craters and mud holes. As he worked his way slowly back, he noticed a few small wisps of smoke drifting into the air from a crater. He guessed that this was where a shell had landed and that it was still smouldering. However, as he got close, he saw that in the crater were two members of the Salvation Army. They were handing out hot cups of tea and sticky buns. My dad sat on the edge of the crater, ate the bun and drank his tea. To the day he died, whenever he saw the Salvation Army band, usually at Christmas, he would give them some money and regale me with the story of the tea and sticky bun. In that moment, he said, it was the best cup of tea ever. I hope this has been of interest. Take care, Andrew. Our next story is from James Spivey. The following concerns my paternal grandfather, Raymond Spivey. There's a letter my grandmother, Alice, wrote on the 3rd of September, 1939. They were on honeymoon in Dorset, and she wrote home in gloom. But, as it transpired, my granddad had a very fortunate war. He joined the RAF in April 1940, but was apparently considered too old at 27 to be a fighter pilot, and was placed in a barrage balloon squadron. His letters detail his struggle to find a way into training, and sometime in 1943 he gets wind of the British Flying Training School, a scheme set up via Lend-Lease whereby British pilots would be trained in southern USA, where the conditions meant they could fly all year round. In April 44, Ray sailed to Canada before being transported to Falcon Field, Arizona. On the journey, he met a man called Claude Millington, who had become his sidekick. Claude was known as Millie or Joe, but a quirk of mishearing meant that the moniker Lord Millington was inscribed on his ration book, which his daughter still has. After five years of war, Arizona was paradise. Letters describe his joy at the sun, freedom and abundance of food. On weekends, the recruits would be taken to private homes where the locals would feed and house them. Millie and Spiv were befriended by a family of farmers called the Martins, who would take them hunting and fishing. Ma Martin wrote to Millie's family in England, expressing her delight at hosting a lovely young pair of gentlemen. She and Pop Martin had lost their own son in the Pacific. He'd been a platoon leader in the Marines, and Ray guessed that their presence was helping the Martins cope with their bereavement. When they were not dining at the Martins, Millie and Spiv would go on adventures. On one occasion they hitched to Hollywood and were given a lift by the American actor Tyrone Power's mother, who offered to help the two young men as her son was himself a pilot in the Marine Corps. Only a year before, Ray had been to see his latest film in Leicester Square when stationed in London. On other occasions, they were less fortunate. They blundered into the Mexican border town of Nogales and were detained as illegal aliens by officials who couldn't understand their broad Yorkshire and Birmingham accents. After a while, they were released and returned to base, but by now they were officially AWOL and the unfortunate pair were sent to the CO's office who went up the bloody wall confiscated their jalopy and put them on jankers for several weeks. They successfully completed their training, but luckily for them the war was drawing to a close and Grandad Ray was demobbed in January 1946, having spent the last year of the war flying, hunting, fishing and adventuring around the southern USA. Not a bad posting to have had. 
It is here that my part in the story kicks in. I contacted the museum at Falcon Field, who were putting together a display about the RAF and their time in Arizona. They asked if they could use Ray's photos and letters, and of course I agreed. Several years went by, and suddenly, out of the blue, I received an email from them. They'd received an appeal from the daughter of Claude Millington, asking the whereabouts of one Raymond Spivey. Growing up, she'd heard all the stories and was trying to find her father's best mate. After the war, Millie and Spiv lost contact with each other. They met again in the 50s but drifted apart. Millie had expected to meet his old comrade at a reunion in the 80s, but was sorely disappointed when Ray didn't show up. Everyone looked around when he walked in and asked, Where's Spiv? The Millingtons kept looking for Ray, calling every spivey in the phone book, but to no avail. Claude despondently concluded, I think he's a goner. He was right. My grandfather Ray died of a sudden heart attack in 1969. Millie himself died in 2004, never knowing what had happened to his best mate. Thanks for the podcast, gentlemen. Best wishes from the present day, Millie and Spiv. Our final story comes from Paul Blakey. Hello, gents. Love the podcast. You've changed my appreciation of the Second World War with all the amazing guests you've introduced me to. Well, thank you, Paul. Because of this, I've been inspired to look into my family tree. And as I was investigating, I got speaking with my granddad, who has just celebrated his 90th birthday. He told me a really interesting story about my great uncle during the war. Great uncle Henry was born in 1903, so was too young to sign up during the First World War. By 1939, he was at the older end of the age bracket and was a carpenter joiner making incredibly fancy furniture. When war broke out, Henry had started working for the Ferry Aviation Company at RAF Ringway, specifically the Manchester Wivenshaw Aerodrome factory that Ferry had set up there. As you can imagine, I got rather excited to think that he might have worked on the famous swordfish. Alas, it was not to be the case. However, rather than being disappointed, I was amazed at what my granddad told me next. Turns out Henry was employed to make wooden cows and sheep. I was confused. Why? I asked. Well, said my granddad, the factory roof was covered in camouflage. On top, the roof was covered in soil, grass turf and fake partition stone walls so that any German bombers or reconnaissance planes would assume it was just another English field full of livestock. Each day, Uncle Henry would have to go up on the roof with his work chums and move the wooden cows and sheep about before daylight so the animals looked like they had moved around the fields just in case the Luftwaffe took photographs and saw through the masquerade. I was truly amazed. Had people like my Uncle Henry not been contributing in the most bizarre way, the factory may have been bombed, hindering production and potentially costing lives. Just goes to show that everyone that contributed during the war were heroes in their own way. Many thanks and keep up the great work, all of you. Kind regards, Paul Blakey. That's all for this episode and also this series of family stories. I can't tell you how much we've enjoyed reading your stories. It's been a genuine pleasure to share them with the whole We Have Ways community. Please keep sending your stories in so that we can start a third series in the summer. Email them to wehavewayspodcast at gmail.com or leave it on the member's site under the Family Stories tab. A reminder, that's patreon.com slash wehaveways. Thanks for listening and see you again in the summer.